Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for uh, inviting me uh, for giving this presentation, and uh, thank you very much for attending my presentation, or actually the presentation of our from our electronics research team. So, in the context of this particular um, workshop, we we essentially wanted to to uh, highlight some of the research that um, is done in power electronics within the School of Engineering of the University of Edinburgh. So a little bit of context. Um, so this is our academic team. Um, uh, so essentially the Institute for Energy System this, um, made a strategic decision now um, a couple of years ago to uh, invest heavily into power electronics in order to complement their uh, activity on renewable energy. Uh, which has been one of the big legacy uh, and acknowledged uh, point where the Institute for Energy System was acknowledged so far. So uh, about three and a half years ago, um, Professor Stephen Finney was appointed uh, at, um, with the chair in power electronics um, coming from uh, the University of Strathclyde. I shortly after uh, that joined him uh, after having finished my PhD and postdoc at Imperial College. And recently, we are very fortunate to have also uh, been able to recruit Dr. Paul Judge, um, who also did his, in, his um, PhD at Imperial College. Uh, and um, as a, uh, yeah, so between the three of us, we cover quite a wide range of topics within power electronics, all the way from semiconductor devices to uh, converter topologies to interactions with the grid. Um, so since then, we have essentially been um, building up our team, and uh, so far we are fortunate enough to have about 10, PhD, uh, 10 researchers, actually, uh, nine PhD students and one postdoc uh, working within our group, covering a wide range of topics from uh, wind turbines technology to modular multi-level converters for HVDC converter stations uh, to uh, virtual synchronous machines. Um, and uh, and uh, semiconductor devices and uh, wide band gap devices as well. <clears throat> so just for 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 the sake of the of the context, so um, the reason why we I mean we're obviously convinced that power electronics is very important, but the the, the central point why power electronics is important within the grid is because it is now playing a role and, and a growing role um, at every single corner. Um, of the electricity grid and uh, the energy chain, all the way from generation or, um, to the load, to storage, transmission, distribution, uh, which is why uh, making sure that those uh, power electronics devices are actually working at best as possible and, um, and looking at ways to extend their mission um, from just basically converting power um, into providing additional type of services. So that's the so that's why our lab as uh, our our team uh, between Steve Paul and I are essentially focusing on on looking at different uh, different ways of in uh, of pushing the performance of power electronics, um, and one of the first pieces of equipment that we have de uh, designed and developed in our lab is what is what we call the double pulse rig, which essentially is a very advanced uh, experimental uh, experimental platform which allows us to test the devi uh, semiconductor devices um, uh, to a very high power point. Traditionally, if you want to, to test a device, then you need to design a full converter for it and run it at the maximum power, which in that, ca in that case for this kind of very high power devices would be in the megawatt range, which obviously is neither practical nor desirable if you want to just do a couple of, uh, of tests on the switching behavior of such devices. So the point of the uh, double pulse rig is, is essentially to be um, to test the independently the voltage and the current uh, capability of those devices by uh, by just um, providing them or making them go through very specific type of pulses. Um, the characteristic of that particular uh, double pulse test rig is about, uh, it, we can test devices up to 2000 volt um, and 1.5 kilo ohm, which is a lot of energy. Uh, so inside in the, uh, at the very bottom where there is like a big st uh, st um, scary sticker saying like strong magnetic field, there's actually a very large coil inside in order to, uh, uh, to ensure that the current is rem uh, remaining constant uh, throughout the test 
at the required um, uh, yeah at the at the required um, the, uh, current and uh, interestingly the amount of energy you can store inside is actually just enough to just power a shotgun or a big cup of tea uh, but that's the type of energy that we actually need uh, in order to test those those big power devices uh, so um, so what I will be following on is mm, some examples of uh, work that we have been working on uh, or research we've been uh, pursuing over the last few years. So one of them is, for example, the concept of hybrid switch. So wideband gap devices is, um, is well, I won't say new, but it's definitely um, uh, a growing and now commercially viable uh, type of semi uh, semiconductor devices for high power applications. Namely, what we are mostly interested in so far is silicon carbide devices which offer, offer the, uh, one of the big advantages that they massively improve their uh, switching performance compared to classic silicon devices. In the, um, uh, but the thing is those wide band gap devices, whether it's silicon carbide, GAN or, uh, or, or gallium uh, arsenide, they, um, by definition, they will remain more expensive than traditional silicon devices. Firstly, because of difference in volume uh, of manufacturing of the devices, but also because the, um, inherently the manufacturing uh, of those white band gap devices is much more uh, energy consuming and therefore costly. Uh, so one thing with that we've been looking at is how can we essentially merge uh, the white band gap devices um, uh, technology and uh, normal silicon uh, semiconductor devices uh, technology in order to, uh, to, get, uh, to get the best performance of both worlds, meaning that um, tr let's try to see if we can get the good switching performance of the white band gaps without spending uh, as much as having a full power uh, device able to, uh, to do the full job and complementing that with, uh, with a normal silicon device, which is the, the case here. So we have essentially two of those uh, high power semiconductor devices in parallel and by using very careful timing and by careful, we're talking about like, uh, um, uh, as you can see on the slide, we're talking about uh, steps of 250 min uh, nanoseconds um, because the switching uh, events are actually uh, lasting about one or 10 microseconds. So that's, that's, that's why it's important to be very precise in timing. But achieving that uh, actually pro um, provide us with uh, some, uh, so just showing, this is the type of waveforms that we get from uh, those are experimental waveforms, not, not simulation. Uh, this is what we can get from this particular type of setup, where you can see that the normal silicon MOSFET, which is uh, the blue curve um, uh, on these plots, are characterized by, uh, so the, the silicon actually, the silicon IGBT um, is the red curve actually. And you can see how slow the voltage rise is um, and also how it overlaps with the current waveform which means that there is a lot of energy lost during the switching event. Comparing that to an, uh, to an actual silicon MOSFET um, alone, then you can see that the silicon carbide um, is indeed a lot faster at uh, the rise and fall of voltage and current respectively. But that very fast rise and fall also generates quite a lot of oscillations, uh, which translates into very bad EMIs, which also is a is a growing problem in, uh, in power electronics or in electronics in general. The yellow curve here being essentially the hybrid switch where uh, both a silicon and a silicon carbide devices were used in, par uh, in parallel with very careful and optimized um, switching timings. And you can see how much the switching performance has been massively improved from all the way the red curve all the way to the yellow curve. Um, and that's the type of research that uh, the results that we can get with uh, with that double pulse rig. Moving forward, um, there are some, we're doing some more research on a smart gate driver. So this is a research which was essentially pushed by, pushed by Dr. Paul Judge. Um, the idea here is that again those oscillations responsible for a lot of EMIs. Um, we're trying to see if we can use some smart gate driving technology the way we essentially drive the semiconductor device in order to quench those, um, uh, those oscillations by essentially, instead of, of using um, a simple powering uh, signal from the gate driver to the semiconductor device by actually just properly modulating that gate signal in order to, um, uh, to make sure to eliminate these kind of, uh, of oscillations. And 
the results that we've been having so far, and there is uh, some publication go um, uh, going on in the background at the moment, uh, is showing that we actually can, can do that. But for that, again, that requires very advanced uh, gate driving technology. As you can see from the slides, we now are down to the uh, time scale of 2.5 nanoseconds in order to, uh, to, uh, to have the exact uh, this. So you can see, uh, actually on that slide, I have the results from, this is the original, um, uh, those are the original waveforms from the um, uh, from a simple switching of the device where you see a lot of those associations and if we use advanced um, smart dry, uh, gate driving technology you can see how much those associations are essentially dumped extremely quickly at the cost of a slightly higher switching losses but with still much lower compared to a normal silicon device other type of uh, going a bit more higher up we're looking um, also a lot at converter technologies where we could be uh, mixing not only uh, high, not only hybrid semiconductor devices, but uh, hybrid converter technology. So this is an example where we're looking at uh, a normal. Uh, sorry, now I'm having a, uh, a slight issue there, um, or maybe reminding me of time. Um, the, so we have essentially looking at all the type of uh, research where we have a normal silicon IGBT converter in parallel with a silicon carbide converter. And, we tr um, and in that case, we optimize the switching of the silicon carbide converter, which can switch at a much higher switching frequency um, in order to act as, a, um, uh, as an active filter of the output, uh, to filter the output of the normal silicon IGBT converter. Uh, and as you can see from this uh, graph, you see that uh, the um, output of the silicon IGBT converter is actually quite rough. You see those blue, uh, yellow, and red curves corresponding to the output current of this converter, which kind of follows the, the sine wave, but with a lot of choppiness into it. Whereas the, uh, the output of the uh, silicon carbide uh, converter looks even more rough from the very bottom graph, as you can see, but actually that roughness, roughness is um, is actually calculated and optimized in order to get that output current, which is extremely smooth, which is that middle curve there. Uh, and that's only using two level um, converters, not mod modular multi level, which is also another type of research that we conduct here. So uh, as we are very proponent of testing because the proof is in the pudding and we are engineers, we like toys. Uh, so we're, we, we've been building those, uh, those converters in the lab. Um, at the 90 kVA um, rating in order to test uh, and make sure that this happens. Because the thing is uh, those, um, uh, those converters are now operating at with such precise timing and, uh, and rating that uh, simulation sometimes can be a bit treacherous. So, um, so it's always good to verify this and also showcasing the uh, the expertise that we have within our group. Uh, um, talking about expertise, we, uh, we essentially have a lot of uh, experience working in consultancies with uh, private companies. So that was a, a previous project with Fraser, Fraser Nash from uh, uh, conducted that by Dr. Paul Judge, um, looking at essentially interconnecting energy storage with uh, modular multi-level converter technology. Um, other type of consultancies that we've done in the past, uh, there was the, a lot of work done with, uh, at the time, well, G now, um, uh, on the HVDC converter technologies, whether it's the alternate arm converter or lo looking at the control transistor, uh, transistor bridge um, or the, uh, the power group converter, all essentially looking at new type of uh, converter technologies uh, topologies for uh, HVDC applications and all leading to uh, conferences uh, and patents uh, filed with the, the institutes. Um, there were also some more uh, consultancy from done at Strathclyde by Professor uh, Stephen Finney. But just to give you a bit of context on the modular multi-level uh, converter uh, research that we, uh, that we have been conducting and carry on conducting, this is essentially an example of two different types of topologies that you may find. The one on the right being the MMC, which is now considered a classic um, voltage source converter top, uh, topology, which essentially relies on those um, submodules, which is those tiny elements there. 
So those are the C modules, and each one is responsible for generating a small voltage contribution, which once it's summed through the entire stacks of C module will generate a very smooth, smooth waveform. Those converters are, are extremely efficient and generate very high uh, power quality, uh, uh, especially in terms of uh, current distortions uh, being extremely low, but they do require quite a lot of space. And for example, those tiny elements there are essentially just corresponds to, uh, corresponds to inductors, but in practice actually are those big white cylinders um, in the converter station. So one, one of the many things we've been looking at is looking at different type of AGC converter technology, like for example, the extended overlap AAC, um, which uses an, a lot of different combinations and making the control a lot more harder, but at the same time, that's, that's, the, that's where the fun is, um, in order to achieve a much smaller volume, thanks to the fact that those inductors now can be sized a lot smaller, but also can achieve DC full blocking capability, which was, is something that the original MMC cannot achieve on its own. So we've got some tests here. So I've got, uh, those are just essentially showing the fact that not only we, we do simulation, but we actually do, um, uh, do um, have those experimental results where we throw, for example, um, short circuits on those converters. Not only we spend years building them, but we actually are fine short circuiting them. Uh, and the fact that those converters can actually just react uh, to these kind of events very fine. Um, so looking at, um, abilities to overload those converters, especially if we want to, uh, to have those converters uh, providing some extra capability like a, um, uh, virtual synchronous machine. In that case, we need to, uh, to uh, date those converters, we need to provide extra power capability, which may be an issue. And um, yes, looking at uh, integration of energy storage inside those converters, uh, improving their power efficiency. Uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, the, um, one of the points of power electronics research within the Institute of Energy System is to interact with the, uh, the, uh, all the other things, which, for example, is the, uh, the research on electrical machine, and we're essentially designing particular, uh, very specific bespoke modular converters for the CGen machine, which was developed by our colleague, Professor Marcus Muller. Um, and those are essentially a, a, a big list, uh, non-exhaustive, I think, I've, I'm sure I've missed some of them, uh, of partners that we've been looking so far, uh, working, working with so far. On that note, thank you very much, and I will welcome any questions.